Live from Beit Shemesh and broadcasted around the world, you are listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with your host, Nahum Klegman. Interviews and advice from Jewish entrepreneurs from around the world. Listen, learn, be Masliach. Welcome to episode 25 of the From Entrepreneur. Today I have an incredible guest. You hear the term serial entrepreneur at times. And today I have someone who is the social serial entrepreneur, a term I coined for him, Hanan Kaufman. He is an unbelievable person who for 30 years has been creating and starting nonprofit organizations. I guarantee that everyone listening to this episode has heard of at least one of his organizations that he's founded. We're going to go through them. We're going to talk about it. He's had a tremendous impact on the world so far. And we're going to talk about a lot of these organizations. We're going to talk about Next Door, which is in his latest venture, his latest vision, of which I'm an uh, integral part of that vision. So I'm very excited about that. And, uh, you know, Hanan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nahum. It's, uh, you know, it's really unbelievable. I, you know, just to, first of all, I just want to tell people how we met because, uh, you know, we get asked that question a lot. And so just real quickly, a couple of years ago, probably like four years ago or so, Hanan contacted me out of nowhere. I used to be in the domain name space, buying and selling domain names. And, uh, you know, at one point I had hundreds and hundreds of domain names. And one of them I had was JerusalemAngels.com. And this guy, Hanan, emails me, hey, are you using JerusalemAngels.com? If not, can I have it? I see you're not using it. Can I... So anyway, to make a long story short, I called him and we, we started talking. He said, yeah, he's doing, a, you know, he's associated with Asha Torah and he want, he has a vision how he's going to use the domain name. And I said, you know what, if you're going to use it for something good, something for college, so they could just have them have the domain name. And uh, he was very grateful. And since then, this is probably about four years ago or so, since that point, you know, we've kept in contact over the years. And, uh, you know, from time to time, we'll just let each other know, uh, you know, what we're up to, how we're doing. And, and, and I always figured that, you know, at some point in the future, we're going to do something together. You know, that's, that's a good example of you did something altruistic and, you know, giving us the name was very nice. It was a really nice thing. I didn't pay anything. I thought it was a really great name. I think, right. well, I got a great, great deal here. But it turns out that that was, it was the precursor for what we're working on together next door. That's true. That's true. And we're going to get to next door. But first, Hanan, I always uh, try to give people a little bit of a background. You know what? Let's talk first before we get background. Let's talk about some of your organizations, just the name. Then we'll dig in a little. Then we'll go back to, uh, you know, a little bit about your background. Then we'll, uh, you know, circle back to some of these organizations and how they got started. Bizrael, Go Inspire, Jerusalem Fellowships, H New York. Yeah, you got your, you know, I don't even, a lot of these, I don't know if you started, you're founded, but, you know, Jewel, Right, you were associated with Asia Torah for for thirty years or so. Thirty five years. Thirty five years. I'm getting older. You are getting older. I've gotten older. You know, you're getting older, but you're not slowing down, which is unbelievable. Okay. So, well, first of all, where did you grow up? Where were you born? Where were you raised? I, I'm from Fairlawn, New Jersey. All right, that's also funny that we think of Fairlawn, New Jersey, right? Because I'm from Passaic, but uh, right. you're a little bit older than me, just a couple of years. Yeah. And um, but you, you didn't grow up from. Correct? No, I didn't grow up in Fairlawn. I'm a nice third, American, third generation American Jew, went to college, and then after college, went to Israel just as part of a Europe, Europe trip, traveling around. And I bumped into some people, a couple of different people along my way who went to high school. I went to high school with from Fairlawn. And one of them was studying, taking some classes, courses at Asia Torah. And uh, it's in how, the 70s? This is in uh, March 1980. Oh, March 19th, okay. Yeah. And then uh, we came in there and, you know, we studied. We had Rabbi Noah Weinberg, who was the Rosh Hashiva. And we had all, you know, Rabbi Pliskin and all great students there. And it was a whole gang. And this was, uh, you know, this is the, the beginning, you know, or the early stages of the rapid growth of Asia Torah. And I came in there. 1980. So it was very exciting time and uh, changed my life. So you basically, so you became from through Aish. Yeah. Right. And you came, you were on this trip and you decided to stay just to stay there? Or? Yeah. I mean, instead of going to kibbutz, I stayed at Aish for a little while, took some classes. Then I traveled around. Then I came back and traveled around. And we were doing the 48 ways. Rav Noah Weinberg. Right. Famous Noach, 48, 48 ways. ways. Sure. And we had Rabbi Zelik Pliskin as a teacher there with the 40 ways. He did half of it. You know, and it was a great group of people. If I listed up some of the names of the people, these are some of the, uh, my friends and associates and co-travelers through Aish Torah in those early years are, you know, major people you know in terms of the jewish world and they've done tremendous stuff and uh it's uh, a lot of fun awesome like who who uh who was in that the uh, that class back then uh, so a lot of people i start with you know who i mean you know i don't know you know Ephraim shore and Raphael shore and eric cooper smith and 
Nehemiah Cooper, so there's the brothers, and we had uh, Ken Spiro, and we had uh, you know back Nachum Braverman and Tom Myers and uh, and Erwin Katzoff and Jakob Palatnik and Steve Bars and Wow Mitch Mandel. Been... I mean, all the people who built Asia Tour. We we were together at Asia Tour, and then we went on to do things. It's incredible because yeah, I mean, I recognize a lot of these names, and you know, a lot of them have done tremendous stuff, and yeah. for Kali Shal, and uh, especially in the Kirov world. That's what we're about. So. How did you go from student to in more involvement? I mean, look, you know, Rav Noach got us involved, and he, and he gave us a lot of opportunity to take responsibility and to innovate and try things. So it was a, it was a very activist oriented environment. It was a place with a mission. We had all understood the importance of Kiro. We were people who benefited from it directly tremendously. And Rav Noach was a great leader, and he attracted very quality people around him. And, uh, you know, we knew the potential and we knew that we had to share our experiences and that other people like us would really benefit from what we're doing. And there was no question about that, you know, we had a tremendous product, let's say, uh, and a movement to create. And so we just went out and did it. And so what were your, what was like your first movement? What was the first thing that you did out of, uh, or from Asia? I guess Asia was a foundation and. Yeah. So I mean, you- Israel, so I was a student, but I was, I was sort of worked a little bit when I was here, did stuff. I did stuff with uh, UJA groups coming in and get them to visit, spend Shabbat with us. I saw that they weren't doing anything for Shabbat. Right. And we have a lot, a lot of groups came. It was really great. And I worked, you know, in the beginner's program, I, was, I took a lot of different positions in Asia tour in Jerusalem and a lot of, you know, as a young person, as a, uh, a novice to Judaism, you know, I was a, uh, a year, a year and a half, whatever. And I had very, very big responsibilities. It's quite controversial. And my friends as well, we took on big responsibilities and we didn't have the many, many years of yeshiva and the long beers. And that was controversial. You know, the rabbis didn't know how to do it, but, but we knew the, the young people coming in and we knew how to handle them. And we're right, capable you were, you were them. We were them. And it was, you know, logistical aspects as well of it, but we were, had a lot of energy and we knew the market. We knew the people and we were good at it. You know, it was great. When Rabbi Rock believed in that. He very much was a big promoter of that. When did you uh, get smicha? In uh, 1985. Oh, so early. I mean, you, you, this is as you're five, growing. I was, I, I was a student. I learned at Asia for, in Jerusalem for five and a half years. I met my wife there, Shari. We got married. We had our first child. And then we were off to start Asia Torah in New York, the branch of Asia Torah in New York. We did not have, Asia Torah did not have a branch in New York, even though Rav Noah was coming there quite often. It was, right. You know, it was a place where he was always going. And we had a branches, Asia had a branch in uh, Toronto. Right. That was the, what, what was the first branch? The first branch was in St. Louis. It was Chaim St. Willis, Louis. Rabbi Chaim Willis, Rabbi Kalman Packhouse. Rabbi Chaim Willis was the Ellen Willis's brother. She did a his famous Rolling Stone article in the seventies on Rabbi Chaim Willis. A f- f- unbelievable article, great article. And Chaim, she was one of the godmothers of the women's lib movement. She came in oh, with wow. this article, but it was a great article. And so he he, he was out in St. Louis, and then you had Los Angeles. You had uh, Erwin Katzoff and Nachum Braverman in St. Louis with Dick Horowitz, and you had the five guys. Baruch Abinus was one of them. And oh, Baruch I know from uh, Psyche. Yeah, but he, they were in Toronto. And I went and trained in fundraising to get Shimush, as it were, experience in Los Angeles with Erwin Katzoff, Nachum Braverman, and Dick Horowitz. And we spent uh, about seven months out there. Wow. And then I came back and I started in New York. And New York was the first branch of Asia Tour. New York was a tough town. There was a little bit of cure of going on. In one York. of my uh, business back. associates, uh, Ellie Mondro, he worked the... Uh, or volunteered at uh, Asian New York for, for a little bit. It was probably after my time. Yeah. yeah. So from 1986, and I came out and started, I started the first branch of Asian Torah that didn't have a lay leader to carry it, who didn't start it. It wasn't started by a lay person. Mm-hmm. So I came in. It was an interesting experience. And I did that for uh, till 1992, I think. And I handed it off to a guy named Rabbi Yitz Greenman, oh. who really did an amazing job. Right. And took it to great heights, and that's a different story. It's a fantastic story. And then I went on to take over or create an organization based on a program. The organization is called Jerusalem Fellowships. And I turned it into an organization in 1991, basically. It was a program that was uh, very innovative that was created in 1985 to bring secular college and young professionals to Israel on a three part program of connecting to their Jewish identity through. You know, Isha Torah is really expertise in doing that, right. them for a living, making it relevant for their lives. Two was the geopolitics. We, we didn't call it Hasbara back then. We called it geopolitics right. in the mid-80s. And they would meet with Israel. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan was an honorary chairman. Oh, wow. And so it was Arlen Specter, Senator of Pennsylvania, sure. and uh, President Chaim Herzog. 
in Israel. Wow. And Moynihan really got all these people involved. And he would get all the top political leaders to meet with our students, a bunch of college students, and they would meet with them. Wow. So we'd go to the Knesset, the president's house or whatever. And so we learned about the current events from the people making it happen. Wow. And then... We travel the country, travel around the land of Israel and really get into it, a lot of outdoorsy stuff, hiking, all kinds of cool stuff. And this was a fantastic program and it attracted totally secular people. We were basically saying like, what would it take to get me to come to Asia Torah if I didn't stumble on it while I was at the backpacking through Jerusalem? Right. We needed, you know, a more systematic way of bringing people in. We just <laughs> couldn't rely just on Mayor Schuster. So, uh, so that's and that's what we did. And it was amazing. The first trip they had, uh, I was tangentially involved. I wasn't that involved with it, but I was, you know, these are my, yeah, Fry, I'm sure was the, you know, big player with this and Eric and all these guys. And they had the first trip it was in 1985 and there were all kinds of people. Lori Palatnik was on that first trip. Oh, wow. My next door neighbor, Ken Marvette here in Muncie. He was on that. A lot of people, a lot of people who, uh, founder Yiddishkeit and became great families and they went on to contribute to the Jewish communities in a big way and it was like it had this tremendous deficit it went over budget ter terribly right. Rav Nolk was very upset you know but it was really amazing thing and then when they had a couple more programs and it was kind of died out nobody really took it and I was looking for it it was shifting from Asian New York I didn't live in Manhattan I was looking to make a change. So I told them, I will do the recruiting, the fundraising, bring the students, give me someone to work with. And I started working with Rabbi Chaim Willis. And we started doing trips. And from that point on, you know, over the years, we grew it. Mm -hmm. We grew it a lot. And it's expanded out into um, England. And England took it, took on their own version of it after, after a while. And then we started putting rabbis and outreach families on campuses to do Kirov. There was very little Kirov going on in campuses. This is the before, country. this is, I mean, there, when did the Hill, this is in association with Hill houses or, well, or Chabad was on campus or the, was this like a I, totally new? Both. There was, Chabad didn't have that much stuff going on campus. They probably had more than Aisha Torah. Aisha Torah originally was focused on campuses. I mean, originally back in, in you know, in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And as they got a little older, they found it more sustainable and more relatable and have certain be better efficacies in certain ways with young professionals. And they'd stayed with young professionals and adults throughout North America. And they got away, away from, from college campuses. So it was hard to do college campuses because the funding wasn't there for, on the campuses. You had to bring it from outside. Right. So it was hard to sustain. But we worked very hard and we opened up campuses and did stuff in University of Maryland and College Park and Rutgers, Penn State to some degree. Uh, we had a, a bunch of guys, a whole team out in, uh, in Boston with, with Svi Gluck under the Goddard leadership at Svi Gluck and, and some of that stuff still going on with uh, in Boston. Well, now 25 uh, years later. Uh, 25, 35 years later, how have the people that were, have you have any success stories? I saw that you've had some success stories from these uh, early campus uh, programs. Well, there was campus programs and there was community programs. And, you know, we were the front line for Kirov and, and we shifted it over so that we would have more on the ground young adult and college uh, care of initiatives using the Israel trip mm -hmm. to facilitate them. I used to call it built in follow up. Instead of us, you know, bringing them and then sending them back, you know, and wherever they ended up, we changed that model and we made it so we built local efforts. So the local efforts used the Israel trip as a powerful tool. Right. And we built that up. And then, uh, then Birthright came along, uh, 15 years after the Jerusalem fellowships began. Wow. So I know that they've told me some of the people who are honest with us told us that you know, they, that the Jerusalem Fellowships was something they looked at very closely and it was an inspiration and, and model for them at some level. Wow. Uh, of course, we had a, we were a little bit more religious than these guys, you know. Right. <laughs> we had a different kind of content agenda and, uh, and mission, as it were. And Birthright came along and I went to them and said, guys, you know, we have to be part of Birthright. And we became part of Birthright. And Chabad also came part of Birthright. It was a big deal for them. They were not involved in Israel trips at all. Right. I mean, they were, but it was a much smaller scale than we were. Okay. And um, they started doing big time with them. And it was an interesting time because all of a sudden, now there were a lot of people. And this, this is really uh, off the topic here, but, you know. it's, no, it's great. This is, this is great stuff. That a lot of students wanted to go to birthright in the beginning and they couldn't get on. So we had a big, f sudden big flow for all our programs and it was very interesting. And at that time, Rav Noach started having discussions with a man named Rav Ze Zev Wolfson, Alavashalm Tetzal, wow. who uh, was a major philanthropist, one of, you know, probably the biggest investor philanthropist in Kiruv in the world. Wow. That I know of, definitely up there. And also, you know, he was you know, a very big philanthropist, a very special person. He, pro he also raised more money for the state of Israel, in defense of Israel and so on from the United States government than any individual 
person I've ever heard of who wasn't, you know, a president, you know, like his second to APAC. Wow. He's like, the next one down the list. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So he got together with Noah, and they never, for some reason, they always sort of danced around with each other, and they couldn't see eye to eye, and they had strong wills. And, and he, Zev realized that, you know, it's ridiculous that I'm not doing stuff with Aisha Torah because most of the things I do stuff for are, you know, been inspired by Aisha Torah, was started by people from Aisha Torah. You know, it doesn't make sense. And we were doing great stuff back in those days. So Zev said, no, if Noah called me up one day and said, Hanan, I raised you a million dollars. That's what he said. He just called, that's called me out of blue. And, and that was very out of character because Rav Noah was always raising money for his tremendous overhead in Israel. Sure. Plus, he always had new projects, things that he wanted to do. So he left the fundraising with the Jerusalem Fellowships to us. But he called up and I said, Rebbe, you've got my attention. <laughs> he said, yeah, Zeb Wilson's ready to write a check to Aisha Torah, and he wants to put rabbis, outreach professionals, on, rabbis on campuses, and bring the college students to Israel on cure of trips. You do that, right? And I said, yeah. That's <laughs> we do. <laughs> that's what we do. So I started working with Zeb Wilson, Baruch Hashem, back then. And uh, at that point, that's when I got involved with Jewel, because I figured that Zev wanted, you know, results quicker. Right. And the fellowships is like frontline Kiru. It takes a little co-ed, co-ed trips. takes a little while for them to cook. Right. Whereas we had uh, our follow-up programs, which were Jewel. The women's uh, uh, Ishtar program. The Hina programs. So women's Hina program. It's, it's, you know, it's, we've always sort of some, affiliated with Ishtar on some level, but it's independent. And it was started by uh, the uh, Beretskis, who were employees of mine. And they worked for me for the fellowships, and he, they saw the need for this, so we supported them in starting Jewel, which is a very important thing. It was an alternative to Neve Rishalim's Mechina program, and I called them up and said, you know, Josh, I think that we're going to tr- get a lot of money from Mr. Wilson to offer scholarships for the first time that we will be recruiting directly for a Mechina program, a, a non-co-ed program. It's the first time. So that meant, you know, it was a big breakthrough because we had so many people that we figured we'd take Mr. Wilson's scholarships and apply for that. And that's the proposal I gave him. Right. So at that time, Josh said, I'm leaving Jewel and I'm going to work for Rabbi Berkowitz, which was a wonderful thing. But I said, you know, we're about to like blow <laughs> Jewel out up the, up the roof, <laughs> right. you know, we grow fivefold. Hello. <laughs> you know? So that was when Jewel sort of fell into my lap. Okay. And, you know, there were great people working there and doing this stuff and being responsible and running stuff. But we did the recruiting then and we did the scholarships and we started sending directly to Jewel and Essentials, which is Aisha Torah's beginner's program in Jerusalem. So mm-hmm. we started that and that became a big deal. And Jewel was a part of our operation for many years. And we still send students there and we do still, still scholarships and get them over there. We have a staff person here that does that and we have a bit of a budget for that. We're still doing scholarships, sending mm-hmm. to Jewel and Essentials. So we got with that. So then, so we had Birthright. The Jerusalem Fellowships program, which all Jerusalem Fellowships, and it started to grow. And you know, and then we then we're putting working with the Wolfsons, uh, with Elliot Matthias started around that time. Hasbra Fellowships, which was the division of a- Jerusalem Fellowships. I mean, they, he he built it up. He and Fry, I'm sure, built it up very well. And Elliot did an amazing job training people in Israel to do advocacy. They would bring you know people who were passionate. It was this is back during the Tafada in the early 2000s at a very bad stage and people were outraged by what the Arab students, Palestinian students and so on, Muslim students on campus were presenting Doing to their students, you know, right. with their, their PR campaigns and everything. That was when right, the there was a war in Israel and there was a war in the States also. That's These, right, uh, on the campuses. That was the front, that is the front line, still is. And the response, the Jewish community had basically, the organized Jewish community in terms of activism died for when Soviet Jewry no longer became an issue. When there was Glasnost and Soviet Union opened up in the late 80s and the 90s, right. so that ended, uh, you know, 15, 20 years worth of Soviet Jewry activism. Right. Was yeah, it? I remember marching in Washington myself as a youngster going, uh, you know, for yeah. Soviet Jewry. And- yeah, it was a big deal. Right. And, uh, and then it ended. And so the campus, is, there, was no, there was no cause. You know, there was nothing going on. And the Palestinians were at it. And, 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 you know, and Saudi Arabia and all these places put tons and tons of money into campuses. They right. still do. But on the academic level, on the professor level, yeah. and on the student level, professional students to come in and try to change the whole attitude that they're very smart about. Right. And we were flat foot. And here was the Intifada. So that, that was when all several different significant initiatives started for um, Israel advocacy in Hasbara. And one of them was actually the uh, foreign ministry came to Aisha Torah and said, look, because you know, of the Jerusalem fellowships, all the geopolitical stuff that you do and the great student leaders that we've met, we know right. your kids, right. you know, could you guys do something on campus to change this thing? Could we get, you know, do activism? So Elliot and 
uh, Frye got up and did it, and it was, became that was a part of the Jerusalem Fellowship. So also because we were always had an aspect of Hasbara. Mm-hmm. So this when we specialized. So what we did is we had the Hasbara Jewish learning and the, seeing the whole country and really getting engaging into the country in terms of volunteers, in terms of traveling, all that experience. So then what we did is we started doing Jewel Essentials, more Torah learning, less travel, less you know, Israel advocacy. And Hasbra became more Israel advocacy and less touring and less Judaism. And the Jerusalem Fellowships was the balance. And then we would shift it depending on the groups and the campuses that we were working with. So that happened. And then, uh, so we started building with the Wolfsons. Uh, They were very, they invested a great deal in helping to put uh, staff people on campuses. And we worked out deals with them and percentage and so on. And we went around to all the branches of Asia Torah and said to them, look guys, we want you to get into College care of. We'll, we'll, you know, you, for one third of the cost, you can do the Israel trips. We'll cover two thirds. Wilson will cover a third. Our, my donors will cover a third. Our fellowship donors. Right. And you guys can get money from the participants and you can add some money. And between the three of us, we can really wrap it up, you know, bring people and we can get you sub, some, some, a proportion of your salaries for your new care of professionals who are on campus. Now, so we got him into it, you know, and I worked with Elliot on that, and Rafael Shore worked with that, and Eric Coopersmith and I worked on that for a while, and we built it up. It was H Campus. So now we all of a sudden have a bunch of new places, and so places that are recruiting, and we're did doing Nair, more Did Nairla Elif also do campuses, or they were just communities? Well, Nairla Elif is a training program in Israel, so they're not actually- But they're, train- oh, so they're, oh, but they're training people to go into campuses? They're training, training? they're training people to go care of in communities. Oh, in communities, yeah, okay. So, so others as well. And then there were other groups that started to- open up some individual practitioners would start their own campuses. And then um, Ma'or got into it. That's part from uh, Machum Shlomo, Rabbi Rosenberg. He, their group and their their people and their board decided they wanted to invest. And they went and offered some money and helped hire some people on campuses. They brought other people out and they started in Israel trips. And um, Chabad grew during that time as well. So there was, there's a tr- you know, because of the Wolfsons and others, there is a tremendous amount of, of stuff going on campus, cure trips, and many, many more trips. And we played a critical role. And at one point, I went to the Wilsons uh, in, I guess, mid-2000s to suggest a campaign to have 10,000, Jerusalem, called the Jerusalem 10,000, have 10,000 young adults come to Israel through our, that was, was it going through Aish, that's right. our piece, over four years. And we brought them from South America. We brought uh, Sephardic kids from North America, we brought uh, people from South Africa, Australia, uh, some from England a little bit, not so much then. And uh, we did, uh, you know, all kinds of trips and individual students to go study. And we did it. In four years, we had 10,000 students. And it was great. It was really a great campaign. That was it. But something interesting happened along the way. Yeah. And what happened to me, which brings us to where we are today, is that in 2008, we were you know, to three quarters into our some 10,000 campaign or more. Right. Uh, we had, a, uh, we raised, you know, with Harvey Hecker, Hecker, who's the president of Asia Torah, a couple of the board members and our supporters here, just some fellowships came together and came up with one third of the funding. And the Wilson group came up with one third of the funding. And then we, the communities and the participants paid the other third. And it was a fair amount of money. And we lost a lot of our funding. They walked away in 2008. It was terrible economic times, and that who walked away? Some of our funders, some of the but half of, half of our not yeah. not Wolfson, but you're saying no, yeah, but it was half of the money that I was raising, which is one third of the overall budget, which is a fair amount of money. I don't really want to say what it was, right? Uh, you know, it's you know, we're in the seven figures. Half that our expected committed spent money did not come in 2000 by the end of 2008. Wow, and that created a crisis. Uh, we were. Overextended. I had a lot of things going on. It was a challenge. Jewels overhead, doing stuff with the essentials. I had some campuses in Boston and, and other places. And we had many trips and we were a little bit aggressive and um, it showed a weakness in our financial models, but it was also unexpected. So everybody got hit then. Right. So by the time I got into 2009, we realized that we were $1.5 million in the hole. Wow. And, and that fell on your shoulders? Yeah. <laughs> You've, <laughs> you've fell into a $1.5 million hole. Yeah. And you got out of it? Uh, Baruch Hashem. Took about five years. 
Right. But uh, no, thank God. It was, uh, it was amazing. It was, I would say it was one of the best things that ever happened to my life in terms of my career and, and one of the best things. Wait, wait, going $1.5 million into debt and putting that on your shoulders was one of the best things that happened to you in your career? Yes. Please explain that. Because it caused me, first of all, I was probably 50 years old and I said like this, you know, that's it. I'm never going to be in debt again. I don't want to do it. And that's it. Number one. Number, so that meant that I have to change the way the business, you know, right? Because I had been dead many times, just not that much, right? And I, I, it was enough. It was just too stressful, and it didn't make sense. And there were certain decisions that I made that turned out to be very good and brought me to another track and understanding that brings us to the next stage of what I would say is my entire career. Okay. Right. Because my career till then was, you know, a lot of Kiruv, a lot of front direct Kiruv and Ace branches. And of course the Israel trip that, you know, we were innovators, we were leaders in what we call the transformational Israel trip. That means creating a trip to Israel that's going to change people's lives. Right. And, you know, we we're definitely leaders in that. And I, I, I had a, you know, fortunate to work with tremendous people and to see it firsthand and being part of that. So it was very exciting. Now, broke. What are we going to do? And what was interesting is that during that time that drew some 10,000, as we scaled up, we had so many more people going. So we needed to, we ended up taking a very business and logistical sort of tasks fell into our hand. We were working, we, we went directly with the airlines, started working with El Al as a nonprofit, as some fellowships, right. and dealing with, you know, getting tickets and, and the groups and helping all these different groups to get to Israel. I mean, it's no small thing getting them on planes and dealing with the expenses sure. and the reservations and the groups and so on. We were doing this for thousands of people. And then- Plus it, programming? When's it? No, that's just on this side. And also the finances, you know, we get the money from Wolfson's and we help the, the rabbis figure out how many people are going to get and how much money they have to come up with how the students are going to pay and, and all the registration, tons and tons of logistical stuff. And we were putting money in and we were dealing with the money aspects of it as well. And then in Israel, we had a really good staff led by a guy named Shmuel Kunreich, who built a tremendous team. And our offices ended up being in the new building of Eishet Torah when they finally built that. And we were running most of the programming for the incoming people from abroad to Eishet Torah. And it was an independent staff that's part of the Jerusalem Fellowships okay. that worked for me and worked for us. And uh, Shmuel Kunreich was the manager and really did a great job. And it was fantastic. And I said, I really feel bad about dismantling what we built because it's a tremendous overhead. You know, it's a million dollar overhead and I'm a million and a half in a hole. And what am I going to do? We can't, you know, it doesn't make sense. And, and nobody's got money now. No, right. one, everybody's broke. This is 2000, beginning of 2009. Right. So I had this epiphany to create a for-profit travel company that will basically do the same things that we do. In other words, huh. do trips. And maybe we can do bar mitzvah trips and other things. But we had all the infrastructure for a tra Israel travel, right? including the flights and putting together. And we really have the knowledge and the ability and the logistics. And, and experience. We've been doing this at, uh, for 20 years at that point. Right, since yeah, yeah, we've done it many years, but but we really our team was you know some of the people. It's true, some of the people. Two thousand five, so we had a we had a, a you know twenty years, <laughs> uh, almost of solid experience. Some of the people were that here had been here for fifteen years and so on, and uh, yeah, so we did it, and that was a very interesting move. And at that time, what'd you call it? We called it Go Inspire. Ah, Go Inspire. Because it's more than just an Israel travel tour company that we do content and we, we know, we make these Kiro trips, these Hasbara trips and, you know, very engaging. And we do much, much more than a, um, a typical travel company in Israel because we do the education. So we right. organize that. We put it together and we know about it. We come from the Kiruv and the Hasbara background, but now, you know, we're all logistics. So now we're offering this to the greater world. So a lot of our, the organizations that we created and got the funding for, and partnered with all these years, they ended up being our clients. Interesting. There were there were clients before anyway. We treated them that way, right? And so we were customizing doing trips for them, and we continued. And then the Wolfson stepped up, and they got the Israeli government involved, so that there was more money coming in for the trips. So they, since a lot of the local organizations didn't have money, and we didn't obviously anymore, right? So and it's grown. Uh, so we continued. Now that was a very interesting experience, Nachum. The experience I mean is that, first of all, going broke. Second of all, <laughs> starting a for-profit with the same people who were working in a Jewish nonprofit prior. Was, these people, it took a period of time, but we spun out most of the staff to be employees for the Go Inspire and to work on the travel side. Interesting. What, I, what I noticed was there was a paradigm shift. 
This was fascinating to me. The same people doing the same thing, basically, but they took it, they looked at it differently. And they became much more professional. They became much more focused on the bottom line. And it, it didn't take away from people's idealism. I don't believe it did at all. Mm-hmm. I think it enhanced their idealism. And it made them much more professional. And, you know, people just took on roles. And it just really changed. And I was like, look at that. And I saw changes in myself as well, but it was amazing, number one. Number two was it created a sustainable model. In other words, we were able to do the same thing. We were able to, I, now we're the same thing. We were able to do much more, more professionally, better, more effectively. And I didn't have to raise the salary of every employee every month. Because now it's a for-profit company. Because it was a for-profit company, and they were sustaining themselves. The money was good. Now we were making a bit of a profit, enough to you know, start whittling down our humongous deficit. So that's how you paid off the debt. That was how we paid off most of the debt, I would say. That's an incredible story. That yeah. I mean, Go Inspire I mean, is an inspiring story. Well, thank you. Was and innovative. I mean, you get the... That's, from, that's really... from Hashem. I don't... To this day, I do not know how we survived 2009 and half of 2010. We were wow. just... I don't... I, I can't even... We, you know, it was unbelievable. And there were people like Baylor Groner who just carried it so well and Shmuel. And these guys, they work so hard. Everybody works. It's not an easy job. These guys worked really, really, really hard. Right. And they built it into a really solid organization. And it's an envious group of what I say, what people should envy about us yeah. is the team, is how well they work together and how much, you know, they can accomplish and what good work they do. And that to me is, is number one. That's the most valuable thing. And we went on from there to, it did a major change for me because now I wasn't burdened by the, the cash flow. Right. And for the first time in my life, because I didn't have a solid financial business model for all the work I did with Asia Tour in New York and drew some fellowships and all that stuff. I was always under duress. I did never had a dime in the bank. Nobody taught me that. That wasn't what I learned in my training and that wasn't the Rev Noak's approach and so on. And it, it created a, we did a lot, Baruch Hashem, but it wasn't easy. Right. Know, it was a hard way to do it. And now I was freed up and I was excited at the fact that we were building something and creating it. And I started to read books like the E-Myth and all this other stuff and learn about business. And I was, it was a very interesting thing for me. So in addition to creating a sustainable model, it freed me up and it allowed me to become much more sort of entrepreneurial, which I always was. But, but you didn't realize it. <laughs> but I, I didn't realize there was a name for it. And I didn't realize that starting companies and creating, taking a vision and putting it together and creating something new was something that I could do that on a concerted, regular basis. So interesting. So, so talk to me. So we did. So we, we started. So Howard Sterling, my friend Howard, came to me and said, Hanan, we got to use your travel company. We got to bring investors to Israel because they won't get it. They won't <laughs> get it until they go and see the depth of the quality of the intellectual investors. We mean in high tech, or yeah, yeah, the, the high tech scene, the, the the startup nation. He said, "Come on, did you read the book?" I said, "What book?" <laughs> he said, "The Startup Nation: The Miracle of Israel's Economic Development." Right, and so I read it, and I was like, "That's a cool book. <laughs> this is a great book." Yeah, right, everybody has to read it. You know? Sure, I read it. Everybody of course, it. okay, I'm sure anybody's listening to this blog has read it. But if you haven't read it, on the podcast, podcast, yeah podcast. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and so we started doing that. And I went, oh, he, you know, he connected me with uh, some of his friends. He's, Howard was very involved in early IPOs in the 80s, uh, which was quite early. So his chevra, his friends were some of the leading business people in the state of Israel in the high tech industries. So he got me together with the Zisapels and who else? Uh, you know, the Zisapel brothers from uh, RAD, RAD Group. I'm not familiar with that, but well, this is Israel. It's high tech. I thought you knew about these things. Oh, from Rad. Rad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, is this a fellow brother? He got me together with a lot of major players, and I, and I went there, and I went to them, and I discovered what I already saw in the political arena, and in the you know the, with the army, and with the Jewish outreach, all that there are another avenue, and another very receptive group of people who will meet with young adults or adults and tell them what Israel's up to and doing. And it's another entry point to make a transformational trip. So we started doing Investors to Israel. We created a company called Israel High Tech Ventures, IHTV. Wow. And we brought a number of groups, some serious biotech stuff. And it was a lot of fun. And But it, I didn't, it's, it was hard to build it up as a travel thing because they're very, very small groups, hard to get them. Uh, right. I wasn't in 10 areas, probably everybody's, all investors are 
you know, in ten years, their uh, schedules are probably different than everyone else's. Yeah, they're short trips. Trying to get few them people, on. but right. uh, you know, so it's a travel thing. It didn't make sense. I thought it might, and but it was interesting to me. And I loved it. Loved it. It was really cool. I mean, you sure. know, you know, we we just saw you know really inside viewpoint of phenomenal innovation, phenomenal stories. You know, it was just a whole new. And I love the science as well. I'm into science, so we did that. And then I realized that you know, why don't we bring business students to Israel? Huh. Because that these are people who will have influence as they you as know, they grow, grow and graduate, people. right? These are people who can economically be engaged in Israel, uh, whether and, and if Jews or non-Jews. And if they're Jewish, this is a great way to connect sort of business-oriented young people with their homeland and perhaps their heritage. And it's a wonderful narrative for uh, advocacy for Israel. So that and so that's Israel. So, so we created in 2012, started Bizrael, Bizrael, B-I-Z-R-A-E-L, Bizrael, students connecting, business students connecting to the entrepreneurial and the startup tech scene in Israel. And it was a big hit. We took several trips. We worked with the Wolfsons. They were happy to do some trips. We did about four or five with them. Right. You know, it was Kiruv. Well, for this, how this, or this from business. specific business schools that you're bringing kids they or were, city uh, based? No, they like, were mostly, it was a mixture of young of undergraduates and grad students. They were Jewish trips. We did a bunch of those. Then we started Bizrael with Birthright. So we have one of the niche trips. There's a Bizrael Birthright trip. Wow. Israel Free, Israel Free Spirit. We um, had, then recently, uh, we started sort of outside sourcing or making available our services for groups that are coming or in Israel already. So today we were, our timing with Israel was very interesting. It's a whole story in itself in terms of stuff. That's but going Israel's on a campuses. nonprofit, correct? Israel's a nonprofit. Israel Time Ventures is a for-profit. It was a Go-Inspire is a for-profit and Jerusalem Fellowships is, a is their original nonprofit we've had here. Right. Those are the four companies. We have a company in Israel as well for uh, Go-Inspire. And Israel, uh, it's really taken off this year. We had about 600 participants wow. in our programs. And the reason the numbers got so high is because there's a, a real movement for internships in Israel. Instead of people going to kibbutz, you know, to have an experience in Israel, they come and they get an internship in a high-tech job or all kinds of things. Oh, that's Many amazing. That's great. And there's a bunch of initiatives that are doing that. Some for Kirub, some for Zionism, some communities coming in, the Jewish agencies. Well, it's just... Since we started in 212, that time, it just took off. So we were part of the, growing that ecosystem, and we focus on doing the short trip, where we really, really, in a very engaging way, connect young adults, business people with really cutting-edge companies and global companies and the whole scene. And, and so we do some really phenomenal experiences because there's so many things to connect them with and sure. there's different uh, groups and clubs and peers and all kinds of stuff that uh, we're connected with we really have been very fortunate and this is unique by the way israel is the only organization in israel that does this uh, where we bring in groups and we focus on the overview and the, and the engagement and the educational side of connecting young adults with the whole business scene so as far as i know we're the only group that that's all we do and this year since there's so many internships going on that the groups get their students together to do one or two day programming and they want to use Bizrail to come in and run that programming because they realize they can't do it so easily and we're really, really good at it. Wow. So we do those. So we had about, we worked with about, I think about eight or nine new organizations on about 15, 16 trips, one day or in 2015. And it was, uh, the results were fantastic. Uh, they all came coming back, and they want to have more and more. So we're really Beautiful. looking to scale that up. With so we were, you and I were talking about it, putting together more of a team there to build it up because you know it's getting hard to handle hundreds of people. Right, that's going and go inspire. Also, I forgot to mention. Whoops, that in two thousand nine, uh, a friend of ours called us up, Lori Palatnik, Robinson and Lori Palatnik called us up and said, "I know her brother, Randy uh, Zelser." There you go, from Beit Shemesh. And most of your Listeners probably know who Lori Palatnik is. They don't. Yeah. You should Google her and listen to her <laughs> blog. She calls it a blog. Her live, almost live. She has a she has video a blog. Audio show? Oh, a video, video. blog. It's okay. almost live. And Lori was launching a new organization called the JWRP, Jewish Women's Renaissance Project. And she always had a passion about bringing Jewish moms to Israel and turning them on to Judaism and bringing them home. And this, the transformational Israel trip, Lori was a graduate of the Jerusalem Fellowship, so she understood it very, very well. <laughs> and she came to us and said, Hanan, you know, you guys are perfect for us. Low cost, customized trips, do all the education, Shabbos, one-to-one -one learning, the whole works. This will be fantastic. Let's work together. So the first year she had 300 women. That was the beginning of JBRP. Wow. Fast forward 
from 2009 to 2015, uh, it's up over 6,000 women. 6,000 women a Two, year? No. No, you mean total. She's, to, she's, last, she's, she's holding about 2,000 and growing. Wow. They do a few men, also a few hundred men, but it's all women. The, the birthright for moms. And they've built a whole worldwide movement. And the Israeli government is partnering with them, and they're growing. They're in a big growth. And we're their partners. We're their exclusive partners on all the Israel trips. And we do a lot of their flights here also. And But we do do everything in Israel. And as a matter of fact, right now, under these circumstances where you know the Israelis are being tacked and we're going through a terrible time with our Arab cousins here, they just sent this week 360 women out of a proposed 400. So 40 women canceled, and they went. Only 40, wow. And we had to change, make all kinds of security arrangements and everything. Sure. And it was, it was very, very difficult. But they're there now, please God, and they should do well, and they're planning, going strong. They also went last summer in the middle of the Gaza war and so on. And right. It's a phenomenal. It's one of the largest, most significant Kiruv initiatives going on in the world. Beautiful. And we're very proud to be the logistical partners, real partners with JWRP. It's now, Golden Smire, I mean, they do, if I wanted to, or somebody wanted to plan a family trip or bar mitzvah or they wanted to get a group of people together in their community or a shul wants to go to on a, on a trip. So they just call, go inspire, and you you guys arrange everything soup to nuts for them. Right. And this, you're not going to charge me for this advertisement, are you? No. This is not an advertisement. This is, this is an incredible entrepreneurial story. But yeah, but it is, the answer is yes. Though. I want to say that yes out there. We do do all types of trips. Wow, that's incredible. And we do. We do uh, special family trips, some bar mitzvah trips. And, but the beauty of it is the real power of what we offer, and which we, we're, I think that we need to build up, is that for 95% or 90% of all the trips that we do are subsidized trips, that the people are paying only a portion, maybe airfare or less, right. for their trip. The women on JWRP, the students are going on all the Kira programs, the campus programs, and the Wolfson programs. And they're paying a fraction. And they're being turned on. Their lives are changing. For, I believe that there's a market out there that we just have to tap and we have it out there and we just have to learn how to tap it. It's a little more sophisticated that there should be one full paying customer for every subsidized customer. Hmm. So if we're bringing three, 4,000 people a year, then there should be that many people coming who are paying $3,000, $3,500 because people travel, they go places, right. they're looking for experiences and we have it. And we can recreate very similar paying experiences and that we're not doing yet. And that's our next thing. That's our, one of our, that, you know, Israel's growing in its way. Go Inspire has to go. Israel will do that as well. And Go Inspire has to develop that. That's very important. So that we believe there's a very big market out there. And it's at least as many people willing to pay to come as those who are not paying to come. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Hanan, I, I got to tell you, <laughs> there's actually going to be a first. Uh, I haven't done this yet, but, you know, we didn't. We're going to do this interview in two parts because uh, you're already, you know, almost uh, 45 minutes in and we didn't even touch yet your latest vision, your latest idea next door, which, uh, you know, I'm obviously super excited about. Uh, so we're actually going to do a part two and we'll have to release it uh, at a separate time. But I just, I, your, your story is overwhelming. It's, it's exciting. Uh, you know, your history. I mean, you just went through like 30 years of cure of history and Israel trips, you know, in uh, 45 minutes. If you do something long enough, you can actually have a history. You know? <laughs> 30 years. It's a long time. A long time. Yes. But uh, thank, you so, thank you so much for being on, on the show and doing this first part. And, uh, you know, we're going to record the second part and we'll get it out there. But uh, thank right. you for joining thank me. Thank you, Nachum. It's a pleasure, a privilege. Thank you for listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with Nachum Kligman. We hope you learned something valuable and will share this with your friends. For show notes, archives of previous episodes and more information